The director of photography's role is to work alongside a director to create the visual style for a film. They will be in charge of lighting and camera placement, focal length, camera movement, as well as the color of the film. They may also be involved in some of the set design decisions because ultimately how a set is designed will influence how the set will be able to be lit. You may believe that the most important thing that you can have to become a good cinematographer is a good camera. Whilst it is great to have a RED or ARRI Alexa camera, the most important tool that a cinematographer has is not actually a camera. I've seen an iPhone shot that looks like a RED shot and a RED shot that looks like an iPhone shot. The most important tool in a cinematographer's arsenal is not a set or equipment. The most important tool in the cinematographer's arsenal is light. The main talent is using the light to your advantage and understanding that it is not the camera, it's the knowledge behind the camera that counts. By understanding the limitations of your equipment, you will then be able to harness light in the most effective way to create those phone camera shots that look like red camera shots. Light is the essential ingredient for any cinematographer. Janusz Kaminski, the cinematographer of Saving Private Ryan, Lincoln and Schindler's List, amongst many other films, was quoted as saying that cinematographers are visual storytellers. We speak through light and shadow. Understanding how light works is pivotal to creating a certain look. This week I'd like you to take a look at light and how it works in the natural environment. Analyse shadows and how they fall in the everyday world. Have a look at a window and see how the light comes through it into a room and bounces off various surfaces. By looking at natural environment and analysing light and the sunlight's reaction to surfaces, you will begin to appreciate how light works and this is what forms the basis for understanding how to manipulate that light and create the different looks that you're wanting to achieve. And that gets me to our first week's lesson. Understanding how you correctly set the exposure on camera is vital in making sure that you are getting everything you need from a shot. If we look at these two shots, we can see that one appears overexposed and the other is severely underexposed. Stylistically, you may choose to intentionally under or overexpose, but by understanding how you will be able to manipulate the camera settings is vital to making intentional decisions rather than mistakes. So this week we will be looking at the very core of managing the exposure on a camera. To understand the exposure triangle, we first must delve into how a camera works. On a traditional film camera, light would pass through the lens, hitting the film emulsion, which contains silver halide crystals, which would then react to the light. When developed through the photochemical process, they then change into a silver metal, hence the traditional name of the silver screen. Digital cameras work almost the same way with the exception of having the film emulsion replaced with a digital sensor that converts the light into digital data, creating an instant digital image. Three elements affect getting the correct exposure for your shot. They are the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO. Each of these values contribute to the creation of the exposure triangle. So, are you lost yet? Don't worry, I'm going to delve a little deeper into each element just in case and by the end of this course you should have a firm understanding of the exposure triangle concept. Let's start with breaking down the aperture. The aperture. Understanding a lens is similar to understanding how your eye works, with your eye capturing a light that is transmitted through to your brain. Your pupil is like the aperture on a camera lens that opens and closes. Your pupil closes when exposed to a large amount of light to make sure your own vision is not overexposed. The aperture on a lens works the same way. When trying to expose for a scene in a well-lit environment, one can close the aperture on the lens to stop the amount of light getting through to the brain or camera sensor within the camera. This will have a chain reaction effect though on how the camera perceives light. For instance, if you close the aperture, this in turn will affect the depth of field, meaning the area of which you can control your camera's focus. 
If you open the iris up on the camera lens completely, this will flood the image with light, but will also create a shallower depth of field in your image, making it easier for you to control the focus points within your scene. As you can see in the example, the subject is in the focus and the background is completely blurred out whilst if I change the iris to be almost completely shut off then I can see that more of the shot is in focus. When working with the aperture the amount of light getting through to the sensor is referred to as the f-stop. This measurement is used to refer to how big the opening of the lens is. When measuring the f-stop remember that the bigger the number the more shut off the lens is. For instance, an, at an aperture of f22, the lens will be almost completely closed, causing the entire shot to be in focus. Whereas at the opposite end of the spectrum, an aperture of 1.4 or wider will have a very shallow depth of field with a lot of light going to the sensor. You may also hear the term T-stop. An f-stop is measured by the size of the opening of the lens while a T-stop is the actual measurement of the light that it will hit the sensor. An f-stop is similar to thinking about the time it will take you to get ready for work or school in the morning, whilst a t-stop is the actual time it has taken to get ready. An f-stop is a guide to how much light should be going through to the sensor. A t-stop is an accurate measurement of how much light is getting through. You can think of it in the way of an f-stop is a guide and a t-stop is an accurate result. The shutter speed in a camera is responsible for two main things within the camera. Like aperture, it can be used to control the brightness of the shot. It can also be used to control how much motion blur is achieved in a shot. It works by controlling the length of time the camera is open, exposing the camera sensor to light. By leaving the lens open for a long period of time, this will allow for more light to travel through to the camera sensor, causing the shot to be brighter. This will also cause the image to bleed in the areas of motion, causing any movement to be blurry. This effect is caused by the prolonged sensor exposure to light. The alternative is to have a shorter length of time that the camera is open, which will cause less light to travel through into the camera sensor. Choosing your shutter speed is important in creating the visual style for your film. For instance, in Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan, the battle sequences were filmed in a quicker shutter speed, which resulted in a much more jarring staccato effect on the image and caused the viewer to be dropped right into the visceral reality of the war. By applying 40 de 45 degree shutter and 90 degree shutter opposed to 180 degree shutter, which is the, the normal standard shutter degree, by applying 45 degree shutter, we are achieving certain staccato in the, in the in actor's movement. We are achieving certain uh, crispiness of, of explosions. Everything becomes slightly, just slightly more realistic. Whilst on the other side of the coin, a slowed down shutter speed will increase the motion blur and it's often used to accentuate the speed of a scene. By slowing the shutter speed, any motion will become blurred, causing any static objects to appear to be moving through a space extremely quickly. The final pillar of the exposure triangle is the ISO. The ISO is the sensitivity to light. This is sometimes referred to as the film speed when using film stock. When using film stock, cinematographers use different film stock due to the sensitivity to light. Therefore, if they require more light in a nighttime scene, they would then use film stock that was more sensitive to light. The higher the ISO number, the more sensitive to light the stock would be, and therefore, in a darker scene, the less lights you would need. In digital terms, this can be described as digital gain, and it is the sensitivity of the image sensor, but it does have its pitfalls. It works in a slightly different way and is sort of a digital boost to light rather than changing the image sensor itself. If an ISO is raised too high, this results in noise being introduced into the image that will cause a muddying of the image. If you've ever had a phone camera on auto and taken a photo in a low light situation, you will find out how poorly the small sensor on your phone handles the low light. A phone camera will try to adjust for the low light by boosting the ISO as high as possible, causing a lot of artifacts to be introduced to the shot. 
Each camera works differently to maintain the quality of the image when working with a higher ISO, but most cameras will give a nicer image when a low ISO is selected. So, that's so much information, but let's recap a little. The exposure triangle is made up of the aperture, the shutter speed, and ISO. Understanding that if we move any of these values, they will affect the overall exposure for the shot. For instance, if we look at this scene that is currently overexposed, we have a choice to either increase the shutter speed, causing less light to be exposed onto the sensor, or close the aperture, which will also result in reducing the amount of light that gets through the lens. Or the final and last option is to reduce the ISO. Depending on the required effect we wish to accomplish, any one of the options can be correct but understanding how each one will affect the image, we can then make the best decisions to get the result we wish to achieve. For this shot, I am hoping to have a shallow depth of field, so closing the aperture is not ideal as it will cause a deeper depth of field. So either reducing the ISO or speeding up the shutter speed will give me my desired result. So if I speed up the shutter speed, this will now reduce the overall exposure of the scene, but the result will be also reducing the amount of motion blur that I have. And again, this is not the desired result. Therefore, I'm left with the final option of reducing the ISO level to account for the excess light. The reduction of the ISO level will also help to reduce the amount of noise that is in my final image. So this works as a positive for my shot as excessive digital artifacts was not desired for the shot. By understanding how each value works, you can use a process of elimination to work out which value you need to increase or reduce to get the best result for your style. This week, we're going to go back to the original camera and see how light works with this experiment to help us understand how a camera works. This experiment you can do at home. So to understand how a camera works better, it is best to create one with light. Find a room that can be blacked out easily, but it has at least one window, preferably not facing directly into the sun. We are going to first start by blacking out the entire room. Then using a black piece of card, create a 20 cent piece cutout to create the lens. For those of you who are not doing this in Australia, cut a circle roughly 2.9 centimeters or about an inch in diameter. Using a white sheet, or flat white surface, watch as the outside world is projected upside down onto the blank canvas. This technique works as it is reducing the amount of light that is absorbed by objects. Light travels in a straight line and is reflected and absorbed by objects, therefore by restricting the area of light to a surface, you are in turn focusing the light onto a single surface, resulting in a homemade projector. For more info on this technique and why it works, feel free to do your own research into a pinhole camera or camera obscura, as this is the fundamental of what we are creating. Now the projected image may appear dim when displayed on the surface, but by harnessing the shutter speed on your camera, you will get a better result in any photos that you are trying to get. If I slow the camera shutter speed right down to take a photo over a 30 second interval, I am able to get the best results. 